This video is sponsored by Describe. Describe is a service that provides you box text for monsters, spells, items, characters, and other observations for the DM to read to players, and also some great maps you can access, many of them interactive. Great box text can really add to mood and immersion. Today I want to talk about, you know, I love a halfling, so maybe my next character is going to be a halfling saboteur. Through Describe, I can get the following description for my character. It's a move of one square from kindly mischief to dangerous threat. Under that innocent, ruddy-faced gaze, the wheels of trickery turn. The belly, the earnest nodding and smiling, and crumbs on the vest. Those really do come honestly. Easily underestimated, this halfling knows how to sabotage a fight. A dirty trick, a sudden disappearance, a sneak attack. And today's luncheon is on those who are possessed of bad judgment. Over 400 character descriptions are currently available on Describe and the number consistently grows. Check out the link for Describe in the video description and do not forget to use the coupon code TREANTMONK. It's going to give you 10% off your initial subscription. Hey Optimancers, Chris here. We are well into my subclass tier ranking series. We've covered barbarians, bards, clerics, and druids. And today we're going to be covering fighters. If you missed the previous ranking videos and would like to check them out, I've created a playlist called Ranking the Subclasses where you can access these videos easily. Let's discuss the system I'm using for ranking the subclasses. If you've seen this before, the video timeline is marked, so you can just jump ahead. So here is how it will work. I will not be discussing any subclass that is not official content. So subclasses that are third party or playtest material are not included. This is a power ranking. So I'm not taking into account how well they are designed in this ranking or my personal preference. This will take into account how powerful they are as a single class build as well as how powerful they are when multi-classed. I will be assuming feats are allowed and used and that all the optional class features in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything are allowed as well. Just some things to note as well. Features are weighted by how soon they are received. A feature you get at level 3 is much more valuable than a feature you get at level 10 because these features see way more gameplay when you actually play the subclass. So this is not a comparison of which of these subclasses are more powerful at 20th level. I don't think that's very relevant to players. This is a comparison as to which you will find most powerful assuming you are starting at low level and advancing levels through gameplay. A feature you have for 100% of that time is five times more valuable than a feature you're going to have for 20%. And although I will consider all three pillars of gameplay, I will be weighing the combat tier most heavily. The combat tier tends to be the tier that is most reliant on mechanics, and mechanics is what I'm looking at here. I also assume you will not be playing as a solo character. So features that work well with teammates, or even better, improve your teammates, will be considered in the ranking. Now before we begin, I'm going to address a couple common misconceptions before they come up. A bad feature does not make a subclass less powerful. I can add 10 terrible and practically useless features to the most powerful subclasses and they're still the most powerful. I'm only looking at features that make a subclass better. Secondly, just because a feature can be replicated with a feat does not mean the feature isn't good. Feats are not free, and they can be very powerful. They can even be more powerful than a subclass feature. So, a feature that can be replicated by a good feat can still be a great feature, improving the power level of the subclass. And the person playing that subclass has one extra feat they can use on any of the many potent feats in the game. I guarantee you're not going to have enough feats, and having one more is a big benefit. These rankings, of course, are subjective, and I don't expect anyone to agree with them in their entirety. And I do have some personal biases, which will probably become apparent. I like spells. I think they can be very powerful. And that's going to be clear enough as we move forward. Also, I should say, I like to make my saving throws, and I don't care who knows it. Give me a way to do that more reliably and I'm likely to consider a subclass more powerful because of it. Finally, I don't assume you will be limited to one encounter per day. I don't assume you will have short rests whenever you want. 
so features that can be used more often I consider to be more powerful than single-use ones. Now, this is a very common rating system in D&D for the ranking of classes and subclasses, and it includes anywhere from the S tier being the highest and the D tier being the lowest, and I will not be using it. Instead, I'll be using this expanded tier chart that includes an E and F tier. Here are the criteria I will be ranking the subclasses with. If I give a subclass an S tier ranking, I don't just think it's powerful. I think it's probably too powerful. I think there are some potentially game-breaking mechanics involved, and these are going to come into play without requiring high-level play at all. My issue with these subclasses is you have a real possibility of invalidating other player character features. This can lead to overshadowing other players, and so if you're a power gamer, these options are for you. If you aren't, I think I would think carefully before selecting an S-tier subclass. If I give a subclass an A-tier ranking, I think it's a very powerful option. Characters using an A-tier subclass are easy to optimize and have features that should be showstoppers in gameplay, stomping down challenges with abandon. We may not break the game, but we're definitely going to make it a fair bit easier. If I give a subclass a B-tier ranking, I think it's a good subclass. Optimizing a B-tier subclass should result in a very effective character that has a strong contribution to a party of characters. Even with limited optimization, a B-tier subclass is probably still going to be reasonably effective. If I give a subclass a C-tier ranking, I think it's a decent option. Optimizing a C-tier subclass may require a bit more thought about how to make the best use of the features, but they can still be quite effective if handled with some thought and consideration. If I give a subclass a D tier ranking, I think it's serviceable. Optimizing a D tier rank subclass will lead to a decent character that can usually still pull their weight, but I wouldn't expect to stand out. If I give a subclass an E tier ranking, I think it's a weaker option. An E tier subclass needs some extra effort to make a character that contributes effectively at all, or Perhaps the contributions they make end up being extremely narrow, or rely heavily on other characters helping them out. It's still possible to make a character that can be somewhat effective with an E-tier subclass, but if you just play it as it's presented, you can probably expect a disappointing experience. If I give a subclass an F-tier ranking, I think it's basically unredeemable. An F-tier ranked subclass differentiates from an E-tier subclass because it is bound to disappoint, and there just aren't any good ways to optimize it to make it worthwhile. And the F tier subclasses, along with the S tier subclasses, I think can be a problem when considering a team of players because they create pretty overwhelming imbalance. Subclasses aren't balanced against each other, and that's normally okay. But when you have these extreme cases on either end, it can weaken the game. When subclasses receive the same rank, I will be placing subclasses I think are more potent, more to the left of the chart, with the weaker further to the right. So at the end of this series, I will have a comprehensive list from top to bottom of every class and subclass combination in the game, all 114 of them. Here's the ranking list so far. Most subclasses have hit the C tier, meaning most subclasses I find at least reasonably well balanced against each other. B tier is also pretty busy with stronger subclasses, but not out of line. The S and F tiers thankfully have few entries at this point, and frankly I'm not a fan of any of them. So let's discuss fighters. This is the most straightforward class we've dealt with so far. The fighter features are pretty much what we would expect. With our starting features we have a D10 hit points, which matches a lot of the classes we would expect to be mixing it up with the enemies, only the Barbarian has more. Armor and weapon proficiencies are all covered. Strength and constitution saving throw proficiencies, and the standard two starting skill proficiencies with a fairly decent list of options. At first level, the fighter also gets a fighting style, and they have the largest selection of fighting styles. And they are the only class to access this feature right at level one. Fighting styles are often where the character chooses whether they're going to specialize in a particular kind of weapon or whether they're going to generalize more. If you are planning to go the ranged weapon route, 
archery is basically a must and likely the best option mechanically. Though there are a fair number of other options as well like defense or interception that are okay. And then there are some weaker options like great weapon fighting or protection. In fact, a fighter that plans to use a two-handed weapon will often grab something else than great weapon fighting like maybe defense. Though after Tashes, the fighter can now change fighting styles with more levels of fighter. A lot of classes can change certain features when they gain an ability score improvement, but I should note that with the fighter, this actually does open a couple extra windows, since they get additional ability score improvements. The second feature a fighter gets at first level is Second Wind, a bonus action self-heal that can be used once per short rest. The amount of healing is quite high at first level, and it does scale, but not as fast as your hit points. So at higher levels, a fighter finds this less and less dramatic. This also only scales with level of fighter, so if you multi-class out of fighter, this eventually becomes a pretty minor feature. Then at second level, the fighter gets a feature that really separates it from the other classes, Action Surge. Action Surge lets you take an additional action on your turn once per short rest. Since an action includes things like extra attack or the ability to cast most spells in the game, this is not only a strong feature, but it works well with almost any class features. So it's not uncommon to see optimized builds where they take two levels of fighter and that's it. So not accessing the fighter subclasses at all. Technically the fighter eventually gets a second use of this, but not until we're in the levels where we're likely not playing anymore. The martial archetype is selected at level three. This is the most common subclass access point, but there are some classes that access their subclasses at level 2 or even 1. When you select your subclass, you get at least one feature right away, and then again at 7th, 10th, and 15th level. At 5th level, the fighter gets extra attack, which is pretty standard for weapon using classes, but the unique thing for fighter is that this scales with fighter level, so they get 3 attacks with an attack action at level 11 and 4 at 20. That fourth attack is gained way too late to make much of a difference, but that third attack often sees play at tables. And it can be pretty dramatic, and it works well with Action Surge. As an 11th level fighter can Action Surge for six attacks, not including any extra attacks with bonus actions, reactions, or spell buffing. The other notable thing about the fighter chassis is it provides more ability score improvements than any other class. Most classes provide ability score improvements every four levels, with one exception at very high levels. The fighter though is getting an extra ability score improvement at levels 6 and 14. The 6th level 1 comes on early enough it makes quite a difference. And as I mentioned in my ranking explanation, a feat is often better than a subclass feature. So although I'm not sure it's all that interesting to get that extra feat at 6th, it's definitely potent. Finally we get Indomitable at level 9, which allows a reroll of a failed saving throw. And this, unlike most fighter and fighter subclass features, is only regained after a long rest. This one scales with level, but it comes on pretty late to begin with. So we're not even seeing our second use until 13th level, and a third use at 17th. The base fighter gives us lots of attacks, at least eventually. For the first 10 levels of play, it's pretty standard for a weapon user, except for the action surge they get once per short rest. That extra feat at 6th really does help build the fighter, as feats are often building on each other. One thing I do find though is that when you compare a fighter to other classes that get extra attack at level 5, and also have class and subclass features, but those classes have spells, it's a little bit tougher for the fighter to make up that difference. So overall the fighter ends up being on the weaker side of the list before we take the subclasses into account. Fortunately for the fighter, a few of the subclasses are really good. Our first subclass is the Arcane Archer. This subclass was first introduced in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and it's presented as an archery expert that mixes magic into their archery style. At third level, we can get an additional skill proficiency of Arcana or Nature, and a cantrip of either Prestidigitation or Druidcraft. Now, if you were hoping for spells with this subclass, this is it. One cantrip, a cantrip that's more flavor than enhancement of your archery, so we're not much of a spellcaster. The bonus skill proficiency, of course, as always, is okay. Then we get Arcane Shot, and this is the feature that really defines this subclass. We choose two special options we can use when we take the attack action with the bow, 
and this is the first thing we should take note of. This really narrows your weapon selection. You can't use crossbows or slings and use it with this feature. Just a bow, either short or long. We decide whether to use this feature after an arrow hits a target, so we don't ever waste them on a miss. But here's the part that really hurts. We have two uses per short rest, and this only increases at level 15. So we're going to have two uses per short rest, probably through the entire campaign. And those two uses go really, really fast. And after you use them, you're a fighter with a cantrip. We have a total of eight special arrow options, and there are some really good ones. A lot of them provide saving throws, which we calculate our DC for them using our intelligence score, which, let's be honest, we're never raising. By the time we have the feats we want and raise our dexterity score, the campaign's going to be over. You can definitely work out a 16 intelligence on a fighter, so you can get that decent DC, but there are sacrifices for doing that. And again, that intelligence score is never getting higher than 16. Now, if you got more special arrows, it might be worth raising intelligence, but for two arrows, just not worth it. There are a couple arrows, though, that don't provide saving throws. So technically, you can play an arcane archer that dumps intelligence, and honestly, that's not a bad option here. The arrows get a damage boost at 18th level, so way too late to be much of a factor. This is truly the best feature an arcane archer gets, but those two arrows per short rest, I don't know what they were thinking. It's, it's just not enough. I get that some of these are probably more potent than the Battlemaster maneuver, so they didn't want to give as many uses as a Battlemaster gets of their maneuvers, but come on, it should still scale with level. So this feature is just too limited, and like I said, the entire subclass works around this one feature. At 7th level, we get Magic Arrow, which ensures all our attacks from bows are treated as magical. The value of this really depends. If you're in a campaign where magical weapons are hard to come by, this could be pretty essential. But once you have a magic bow, this is redundant. Honestly, I would expect this to be redundant in most campaigns, or at least I would hope so. We also get Curving Shot at level 7, which allows you to get another chance when you miss with an attack with your bow. So when you miss, you use your bonus action, and then you can reroute the arrow to a different target within 60 feet of the first target. This specifies only with a magic arrow, but remember, all our bow attacks are now treated as magical. I'm not sure why they muddied the waters here. I mean, just say with an arrow. But the designers have clarified that magic arrow works with this feature. So again, they just used an extra word here that they didn't need to. So for me, this is a bit of a patch for not being able to use a hand crossbow with crossbow expert. As an essence, we are using our bonus action to make an attack, but keep in mind that if we actually hit with our attacks, then we can't use this. Also, if there's only one target, then we can't use this. And even when we can use this, we aren't getting an attack on the target we were trying to focus on. So this feature, it's okay, but it is not great. So Arcane Archer, I think, is a bit of a shoot and a miss. This one, I really do want to like more than I actually do. I mean, the Arcane Shots are actually really good. It's just, you have so few of them. And I think you notice it more and more as you level up, because you're just sticking at that too while everybody else is getting features that scale. And the scaling here is just more arrow options, but never more arrows themselves, until you get to 15th level, if you get to 15th level. But I do think you can make a decent Arcane Archer, so I am just barely going to slip it into the C rank. This was really close. This could have been D very easily. But I think that, you know, the decisions you need to make to make this passable are not that difficult. So I think it does qualify for C, but this is a weak C. Our next fighter subclass is the Battlemaster. The subclass is in the player's handbook. At third level, we get one really good feature, and then we get Student of War that gives us an artisan's tool proficiency. Combat superiority, though, is a great feature. 
We pick three maneuvers and we use these maneuvers with superiority dice. And we get four of those. When they're used, we get them back on a short rest. We get additional maneuvers and another superiority die at 7th and 15th level. The superiority dice start as a d8 and they scale too, eventually becoming d12s but not until very high level. So we scale up on three fronts here in our number of uses, the size of the bonus, and the number of options. I love to see this kind of thing where you're actually significantly rewarded for leveling up in a subclass. Now there are a lot of different maneuvers. Sometimes they're made as part of a weapon attack, sometimes as a reaction, sometimes it replaces a weapon attack, or sometimes it only requires that you move. There's quite a variety of types of use. And I won't be going through all of them here, but the list is pretty long, with a lot of cool and effective options. The superiority die also often asks the damage of the maneuver when a weapon attack is involved. Now the downside of combat superiority is that we still run out of uses. Four uses, even five uses per short rest, can run dry fast. Now, I'm not saying this needs more uses, but the uses keep this feature in line, which from a design standpoint is probably a good thing. So this is a good feature, quite potent, but definitely not broken. In addition to the scaling of combat mastery, we do get a feature called Know Your Enemy at 7th level that allows you to evaluate a creature out of combat. This is obviously circumstantial, and the information you get is really limited. But I have seen this used with some degree of effectiveness to evaluate certain saving throws and armor class. This one is not great. It's not quite awful, but it is a bit of a footnote compared to what we already have. The big feature we're getting at 7th level is our combat superiority dice increasing. The 10th level feature is just combat superiority scaling, as I've already gone through. So the Battle Master is all about the maneuvers. Maneuvers make a Battle Master better at mobility, accuracy, control, and damage, but a limited number of times. There was quite a while when I figured that Battle Master was the most powerful fighter subclass, but the more recent additions of fighter subclasses have dethroned them. Still, I think Battlemaster is one of the better fighters. I mean, maneuvers are almost like spells. And a third level Battlemaster is getting a similar number of these maneuvers as a spellcaster is getting actual spells, assuming you're taking a short rest. And this is on top of the fighter features, not instead of them. And it's complementary with them. Honestly, this could almost be a B rank, but I'm not going to be giving it a B rank, and this is why. You can really make an effective battle master, but you also need to pick maneuvers carefully and you need to use them really carefully and tactically in order to compare with the B rank subclasses. Most of the time, what I see though is when battle masters are played, they use the maneuvers to swing a couple extra hits, and that's fine, and then they run out. And there's nothing wrong with doing the build that way, it's still perfectly effective but it doesn't stand out quite the same. Nevertheless, this is a very, very strong C tier ranking. The next subclass is the Cavalier, which presents itself as a mounted fighter, but surprise, almost none of their features have anything to do with being mounted. At third level, we get a skill proficiency, so okay, and a language. Then we get Born in the Saddle, which provides advantage to saves to fall off your mount, allows you to mount or dismount more quickly, and land on your feet if you fall off your mount, as long as you aren't high off the ground. So these bonuses are really small, even for a mounted character. Do you know what the DC is for getting dismounted? It's 10, and so we have advantage on it. So if we never fall off our mount, then the not falling prone doesn't come up. And your mount has movement of its own, so the cost of speed in mounting and dismounting, it's seldom an issue. The whole thing is more flavor than substance. But our premier third level feature is called Unwavering Mark. This allows you to mark a creature you hit with a weapon attack, and the marked creature has disadvantage to attack anyone but you. So a bit like the Armorer or Ancestral Guardian Barbarian. Also, if the creature does damage to anyone but us, and that doesn't even need to be through an attack necessarily, we can get a bonus action attack against them on our next turn with advantage and a fairly good damage boost. 
The biggest limitation of this feature is the penalty only applies while the creature is within five feet of you. So although in theory we could mark multiple creatures on our turn, we really can't expect to prevent more than one of them from just moving away from us and ending the mark immediately. And even then, we basically need the sentinel feet. Otherwise, this is just a way to get a reaction attack. Which isn't awful awful, but it's no big deal. And that's assuming they can't move away from us without provoking, which some enemies can do. Another limitation is the bonus action attack. This one is really limited in uses, and they only come back on a long rest, and they could easily be gone in a single fight. There are also some hidden limitations built into this feature. In order for this feature to work at all, we have to be right next to a creature. So this isn't going to work well with ranged weapons or reach weapons, and even eventually really limits the use of things like the crusher feet. Also, the special attack, which as mentioned is limited in use, uses our bonus action. So if we do have another bonus action option, there's a conflict. So do I even bother with the Polar Master feat when I can occasionally make bonus action attacks anyways? Maybe, but if I do, I am getting less from it. That bonus action attack does okay damage, but not enough uses. I mean, long rest recovery? So overall, unwavering mark, it's okay, but it's not great. And I don't think it's as good as some of the comparable features that subclasses of other classes get. Then at level 7, we get Warding Maneuver. This, on its surface, looks not bad. If a creature next to us is hit by an attack, we can roll a d8 as a reaction, and then they get that as a bonus to their armor class. And they get resistance to the damage if the attack hits. There's two problems here. The first is that our third level feature really screams out for the sentinel feat. But if we take the sentinel feat, we already have a reaction option when someone next to us is attacked. So if we use this reaction, we lose out on that one. Speaking of the sentinel feat, well, well, we'll be talking about that again. The second problem is in the number of uses. This one is based on our constitution modifier, so a different ability score than the one our bonus action attack from a unwavering mark is based on. And again, only recovered on a long rest, and I am sorry, that is bull. Fighter abilities are normally recovered on short rests, but the Cavalier is getting screwed. So a Battlemaster gets their maneuvers back on a short rest, an Arcane Archer gets their special arrows back on a short rest, but oh no, the 7th level Cavalier better not be able to take a special reaction to protect allies more than a few times per long rest. I mean, really? So this would be a decent feature, but it has too few uses, so it's a bad feature. Honestly, I don't even know if this feature should have limited uses at all. That brings us to our 10th level feature. This has two aspects. The first is, creatures provoke opportunity attacks if they move within our reach, so not just moving out of our reach. The second is, when we hit a creature with an opportunity attack, their speed is reduced to zero. So the part about opportunity attacks against a creature moving within our reach is pretty interesting, but actually because of our unwavering mark, I just don't think it's going to come up very often. Remember, we've already given the creature an incentive to attack our character instead of anyone else. So once they're marked, they have little reason to move. Unfortunately, the part where we reduce enemy speed to zero actually hurts. Because as I mentioned, the sentinel feat seems really obvious with unwavering mark. And now we have another conflict. In this case, a straight out redundancy. And that's with a primary feature of sentinel. Tasha allows us to change a lot of things about our characters as we level up. But as of now, we're still stuck with feats. You can change a skill. You can even change your subclass, but not feats. So, can you make an effective cavalier? You can, but there are some challenges. The sentinel feat is obvious, but it also creates all kinds of redundancies. There are other ways, of course, of restricting enemy movement, but I don't know how well they work here. Grappling is the most obvious option, but don't we usually follow that up with shoving prone? And if we do, then what's the point of unwavering mark if the creature already has disadvantage. Allies might help us out, but again, unwavering mark easily becomes pointless. If a creature is caught in a web, for example, they already have disadvantage on attacks. Finally, there's the issue of being the target. Heavy armor and d10 hit points 
maybe makes us more useful as a target than some characters, but we're really not into strong defenses yet. We can get them with multi-classing, but they're not built into the Cavalier. So there's a feature here that could be decent, and it's unlimited in use, and that's always a draw, but you really need to work hard to make this work well in a build, or it's just going to end up being an extra reaction attack. And I never think it's going to be all that powerful. So this subclass ends up a D for me, I'm afraid. You compare this to the Ancestral Barbarian, and they fill a similar function. But the Ancestral Barbarian is just easier to make work in a build. Next is the Champion, one of the original fighter subclasses in the Player's Handbook. I think this is the most played subclass in the game. I, I don't remember the source, but I'm sure I've read that. It shouldn't be, honestly. It's not good. At third level, we get only one feature, and that's improved critical range. So we score a critical hit on a 19. So here's the issue. Critical hits can be really effective. If we have extra damage dice, we can add in. That's why we see paladins often smite on a critical hit, and why rogues have a very big damage boost on a critical hit. The champion, however, unless we've accessed something through multi-classing, is just doubling the base weapon damage dice. So probably anywhere from 5 to 7 points of damage. So do some quick math. There is one result on a d20, or 5% chance, of a champion getting a critical hit when it normally would be a regular hit. So 7 points of damage, and again, that's a best case scenario. Using something like a hand crossbow, it's more like 3.5 points of damage. But divide that by 20, and that's how much you're adding to each attack. So on your average round, we're doing less than half an extra point of damage. It's really almost a rounding error. Uh, and even if we're action surging, we're unlikely to average more than maybe one extra point of damage. It's just not really significant at all. So right off the bat, the champion gives us very little at level 3 unless we find a way to make it better through multiclassing. And then we're not talking about level 3 anymore. Level 3 here is a big letdown. Then at level 7 you get a really scaled down Jack of All Trades feature. This applies half your proficiency bonus to any strength, dexterity, or constitution checks that already don't use your bonus. The best part of this, honestly, is plus 2 or eventually plus 3 bonus to initiative. The rest is pretty small and circumstantial. I mean, when is the last time you made a constitution check? That wasn't a saving throw. I can't remember one personally. So level 7, frankly, it's not awful, but it's not good. It's definitely not as good as the general bard feature that they get at level 2. Then at level 10, we get a second fighting style. Now presumably at level 1, we took our first choice for fighting style. So now at level 10, we get our second choice, our runner-up choice. So at best... And I mean, at best, this is equivalent to half of what we got at level 1. And that's only if there were two fighting styles of equal value to your character. Otherwise, it's less than that. Now, I no normally don't spend much time talking about the higher level features, and I won't here either. But level 15 is level 3 all over again. And it's not to level 18 that we get our first cool feature. That is level 18, so I think that is insignificant. So we end up with a champion that's either a substandard fighter or a 3 level dip in a crit fishing build, and even then it's probably not your best option because it requires 3 levels. So it's so-so as a multi-class, and as a straight class fighter it is a terrible choice, and I'm giving it a D rating. And that's only because you can grab a couple good feats and a weapon and you'll do okay. Though, I have to say, I do have a feeling, and maybe a bad one, that most champions are sword and board. I hope not, but if I was to bet, I say sword and board is the most common build for champion. That brings us to the Echo Knight. This was brought to us in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. At third level, we get two features. The first I'm going to talk about simply because it's easier to talk about, and that's Unleash Incarnation. This, if we simplify it, is a number of extra melee attacks equal to your constitution modifier per long rest. These don't take a bonus action or a reaction, and if we use action surge, they can even be used more than once on the same turn. 
Extra attacks that don't use bonus actions or reactions are nice, and they run out because they're a per long rest feature and we don't get many of them. This is okay. Then we get Manifest Echo. Going over everything this feature does requires way more time than I'm going to devote here. But check my Echo Knight video if you want a full breakdown. And if you are considering playing a fighter and Echo Knight is an option for you, you should because this is a very powerful feature. We can make melee attacks at range, we can shove prone at range, we get unlimited teleports, we have a moat for opportunity attacks, the echo can be destroyed but it's not affected by a lot of things, and it's not all that easy to hit either, and if it is destroyed we can get it back as a bonus action an unlimited number of times and it has no duration. And it is astoundingly good, easily the best fighter feature in the game in my opinion. I mean it's almost like a very small selection of fairly decent spells that don't require spell slots and we can cast an infinite number of times. You know even if this feature was limited in uses I think it would be a good feature but unlimited it is really the standout on this entire list. Then at level 7 our echo turns into I guess kind of an arcane eye spell and it's interesting, they threw a duration limit here, but there's no limit in uses. I mean, to a large degree, that kind of made it strange to have a duration at all. Because you can just use it over and over and over again if it expires. Apparently it wasn't intended to allow you long-range unlimited teleportation, so I wouldn't necessarily expect that to fly at your table. But without that, this is still really, really good. Then at level 10, we can intercept an attack, the big limit here is we have to use this before the attack roll is made. So no using this to cancel a critical hit or anything. This is just not as good as what we got at earlier levels. So Echo. It's a fighter. Kind of. Because it's just way too mobile to be a fighter. How is it the first class that got unlimited teleporting happened to be a fighter? And frankly, how is the second druid for that matter? Then we get great burst potential. Amazing control potential tons of utility, and I mean talk about the value of the Sentinel feat. Sentinel on an Echo Knight? Bonkers. I've played Echo multiple times, I've seen Echo played many times at my own tables, and it is always good. Again, these videos are just my opinions based on my own evaluations and personal experiences. But here is my opinion on the Echo Knight. It is not only the most powerful fighter in the game, it ranks among the most powerful subclasses in the game, period. A rank. Come at me. Our next subclass is the Eldritch Knight. This was our final option in the player's handbook for fighters. At level 3 we get spells. These are chosen from the wizard spell list. We get two cantrips and three spells with two first level slots to cast them. There are some pretty hefty limitations. First off, our spell selections are largely limited to abjuration and evocation spells. And secondly, we just never get many spells or spell slots. I mean, if we get to 12th level in a campaign, we never have higher than 2nd level spells or more than 7 slots. Our spell DC is intelligence based as well, which makes sense. But come on, do we want the shield spell for our 3rd level fighter? Oh, you bet we do. Twice a day? Fine. Then we have Weapon Bond, which allows us to bond our weapon, up to two weapons actually, so we can't be disarmed, which honestly almost never comes up, and we can summon the weapon as a bonus action, which may occasionally come up, but rarely. I've seen this used as a way to get around limited item interactions, for example. Then at level 7 we get War Magic. When we use our action to cast a cantrip, we can use our bonus action to attack with a weapon. This is okay. There are ways to use it effectively in a build. Here's where I'll point out that if we're multi-classed, it doesn't have to be a cantrip we gain through this class or a wizard cantrip at all. If we don't do anything to make the most of this though, then in most cases we have to determine if a cantrip is actually as good as attacking twice or even eventually attacking three times because if it's worse, then the bonus action attack becomes expensive. Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade are obvious but do the math and this is not always that amazing especially considering there were other ways to get a bonus action attack so this isn't terrible but it's not great 
Then at 10th level, we can impose disadvantage on a creature's saving throw against one of our spells when we hit it with an attack. Lots of limits here. Basically, we almost have to combine this with Action Surge to make it work decently. And we just don't have a lot of leveled spells to use. And our spell list at level 10 is pretty limited. So the Eldritch Knight does get some good stuff. Spells are good, and I see multi-classes all the time for weapon users to get access to spells that an Eldritch Knight can get without multi-classing. These subclass casters though, let's be clear they are minor casters at best. They do not get a lot of spells, their spell selection is limited, and they are using low level spells only. Still, spells are good, and you can make a perfectly decent Eldritch Knight. I don't think the Eldritch Knight has as much potential as the Battlemaster for optimization, but it is stronger than the Arcane Archer. C rank and middle of the road C. Onward to the Psy Warrior. This was one of two fighter subclasses released in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and by far the one that got less attention. I think the idea of the Psy Warrior is that it's basically the Jedi Knight of Fighters. A very use the force feel to this. We get one feature at level 3, but it is a feature with multiple uses. It's called psionic power, but you can call it force sensitive if you like. We get psionic energy dice equal to twice our proficiency bonus. There are d6. Basically we start with five dice plus an additional one every short rest, and they scale pretty fast. The d6 is scaled to d8s pretty quickly, and we're waiting a while before they scale again. We have three options for using these dice. A reaction that reduces damage from an attack to either ourselves or an ally, and then we get a boost from our intelligence modifier on that. There's a straight damage boost. Again, our die boosted by intelligence. This doesn't use a bonus action or a reaction or anything, so we can definitely use up our dice that way if we like. Probably nets us more damage than the champion's critical range on that alone. Or we can move objects or willing creatures with our mind. Use the force Luke. This requires our action, so that's a big limiting factor, but we can move them up to 30 feet which is significantly more movement than most of these kinds of features have. This one is different, that we can do this once per short rest for free. Then we use our psionic dice after the first use. Psionic power is a solid feature. We get a generous amount of dice that we can definitely use for some decent effects, plus one more every short rest. And there is a decent range of options to use them on, and they scale. Our number of dice ends up being pretty comparable to a battle master, probably less at low levels, probably more at high levels. The thing though, is if we're going to compare this to battle master maneuvers, we should note that these effects are not as good. We also need intelligence to make them work better, which, like I mentioned with Arcane Archer, is doable, but there's a cost involved. Then at 7th level we get a limited flight ability. A lot of fighters don't get flying features at all, but by limited flight, I mean this is really limited. We also get an improvement that if we do our psionic dive for damage, we also hit with knocking enemies prone or moving them around 10 feet in the direction of our choice if they fail a saving throw. And this is pretty good. So we really do want a decent intelligence on our side warrior. We can't get around with dumping it like you might be able to with Arcane Archer or with Eldritch Knight. But still, now suddenly we have a psionic feature that's probably as good as a maneuver, arguably even better. That is worth noting. Then at 10th level we get a pretty good defensive boost. We can end charmed or frightened conditions on ourselves without using an action or anything, and a pretty so-so damage resistance. And altogether, I think Psy Warrior is not bad at all. In a lot of ways, it's really similar to the Battlemaster, except we need intelligence. Dice recovery mechanics are a little bit different, but probably comparable. And so, I don't think it quite matches the Battlemaster in the end. Still, I think it is a decent C rank. I'd put it right in front of the Eldritch Knight. And next, uh-oh, the Purple Dragon Knight is next. Easily the most disparaged fighter subclass in the game, maybe the most disparaged subclass in the game. This one, surprise surprise, came to us through the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, which brought us more than this in terms of crappy subclasses. 
At level 3, we get one feature called Rallying Cry. The way this works is, when we use our second win feature, we can choose three allies, and they regain hit points equal to our fighter level. Now this is obviously not great, but you know what, this subclass getting the kind of hate it does. And when I look at this feature, and I compare it to the champion feature at level 3, it kind of tells me a lot. I mean, you're 10th level, you use second wind once per short rest, very possibly in combat. I mean, you're almost certainly using it anyways, and you get an additional 30 points of healing. Now that's not crazy healing or anything, but it's probably around triple the healing you would do with second wind normally. Triple. Now it's less dramatic at lower levels, but even at level 3 when you first get this, you're probably doubling the healing. And that's when second wind is actually a pretty good feature. Now, maybe you don't have three allies to be healed. Then this isn't as good. And I'm not saying this is a great feature. But you know what? It's not terrible. It's definitely not the worst third level feature we've seen already. At seventh level, we get an additional skill proficiency, so that's fine. And then we get expertise with persuasion, which honestly is not the skill I would expect the average fighter to be very good with to begin with. So we're pretty good with persuasion, still probably not the best in the party, but in that range. So again, this is okay. Then at level 10, our action surge allows an ally to make a weapon attack with their reaction. Again, we are definitely using our action surge regardless. So now it has an additional benefit. The benefit here, I think, is pretty small. It's one reaction attack. We certainly aren't in the realm of order clerics or anything in that regard. It will basically be one reaction attack per short rest. So I do think this is on the weak side. But again, I don't think it's worthless. The 15th level feature is similar in theme. We're using our fighter features that we're using anyways to boost allies. And that's the Purple Dragon Knight. And yes, it is weak. The healing from Rallying Cry should be higher. Royal Envoy should frankly be a secondary feature, something that piggybacks a better feature, and Inspiring Surge doesn't look like a feature that should be gained at 10th level. So this is not a strong subclass, and I'm not going to state otherwise, but I do kind of wonder why this subclass gets so much hate compared to the other lousy subclasses in the game, uh, even for Fighter. The Champion is a bad subclass as well. But Purple Dragon Knight gets his special status as worthless. And it's not. I mean, there are features that have at least moderate use. We have a decent amount of healing. Not enough of it, but a decent amount. We have the ability to help allies make reaction attacks. Again, probably not often enough. But it's still, again, not useless. And so what I noticed, though, is that all the features here are helping your allies instead of yourself. And so I do wonder whether some players have looked at this subclass and they're only looking for features that help their own character, and therefore they determine that there is nothing of value here. Because if you are interested in helping your allies, there are things here that are not worthless. Uh, the other thing I think might happen is I think a lot of players just know this by reputation, and they haven't really analyzed it, so they assume it is as bad as people say. And again, I'm not saying this is a good subclass. But you know what? I don't think it's the worst fighter. So I'm going to ruffle some feathers here. I am still ranking this low, a D ranking, but I am going to rank it ahead of champion because I think champion is worse than this. This is a poor subclass, but I don't think it's as bad as its reputation. I think the reason it has its reputation is because unlike the champion, its features help your allies. Our next subclass is the Rune Knight, and of all the subclasses in Tasha's Culture and of everything, this either got the most, or at least nearly the most, of the attention. The Rune Knight is a fighter that uses giant runes to, well, do all kinds of neat tricks. We get a lot at level 3 with the Rune Knight. We start with a bonus tool and language proficiency, so that's a footnote. Then we get Rune Carver. This is the premier feature of the subclass. We get two runes that we can use once per short rest, and we get some scaling. Three runes at 7th, four at 10th, five at 15th. So a 10th level rune knight can use eight runes with one short rest. The runes are good too. Some, like the cloud rune, are really good, but none of them are bad. The worst of these 
is probably as good as some of the better maneuvers. But we also get another good feature at level 3. We can grow to a large size as a bonus action. So there are some tactical applications for that. Also, it opens up grapple and shove to huge sized creatures. In addition, we can get advantage on strength checks and saving throws. So now grappling and shoving starts looking really good. And we get a damage boost. Probably three points of damage per round. Not amazing, but as an add-on, not bad. Now the uses of this are just proficiency bonus per long rest. But since it lasts a minute, that means every round of a battle, a number of battles equal to our proficiency bonus. So that's actually a fair amount of the time. So at level three, this is top notch. Ruins are great, Giants Might is strong too, and we get both. I would say combined, these are better than the Battlemaster's maneuvers. Then at level seven, we get a reaction to protect allies, and it's okay, middle of the road for this one. But the big feature at level seven is we get another rune and two new rune options open up, and both these rune options are even better than the base runes. Then at level 10, our great stature feature is practically insignificant mechanically, but again, we get another rune. And if we make it to 15th level, our rune use doubles, by the way. That's pretty high up, though. So the rune knight is really strong, and I'm sure that's why it got so much attention. Turning large is pretty good, but the biggest impact here are the runes. These really beef up your rune knight. This one, I am ranking B. I think it is stronger than the Battlemaster, and I think it is easier to optimize as well. And that brings us to our final subclass. The Samurai was introduced in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and I have seen this in play very little. Let's discuss why. So at level 3 we get a bonus skill or language proficiency, so fine. Not sure why not both, but whatever. Then we get our big feature, Fighting Spirit. We can use a bonus action on our turn to get advantage on our weapon attack rolls until the end of that turn, and we get 5 temporary hit points, and the temp scale to 10 at 10th level, and 15 after the campaign is over. And we can do this 3 times per long rest. This being the primary feature of the subclass is why we don't see this subclass very often. Now I'm not saying it's worthless. Naturally, we'll combine this with the action surge when we can, so we'll get as many attacks with advantage as possible but it is really limited in uses, and almost more of an issue is that it is a bonus action to set up, because we are probably giving something up to do this, whether it's a bonus action attack through a feat, or a bonus action spell, or a feature gain through multiclassing. And there are other ways to get advantage that just last so much longer than this does, if they're limited at all, and this is a three level investment. There are ways to make this decent for burst damage though, I don't think that's going to be your best option, but it is an option. So this feature, I don't think it's terrible. It's so-so. But because there are superior comparable features out there, this is why I think we don't see very many samurai. Then at level 7, we get Elegant Courtier, and we get our Wisdom bonus to Charisma Persuasion checks. So probably a negligible bonus to a skill we're bad at. And then we get Proficiency in Wisdom Saving Throws. Now this is the first feature of this subclass, that is pretty good. I mean, it's as good as one half a feet, mind you, but still, now I can take resilient dexterity and I can be proficient in all of the three main saving throws. So not bad at all. At level 10, our fighting spirit can be used at least once per combat, and that is a nice boost, but it's only coming up after we've run out of uses, which I guess could be after one fight. So this is still, I think, in so-so territory, most of the time we're not attacking with advantage even after level 10. So the samurai comes down to two things. Some very temporary burst damage gained through advantage that we have other routes for honestly that can be used more often and we get some temps with it but not very many not as much as we can probably get through other sources and wisdom save proficiency and that doesn't come into play until level 7. Everything else here is pretty small. And I think overall, this is one of the weakest fighters. I think it's a D, and I think it's weaker than the Cavalier, but it is not quite at the bottom of the pack. And so with fighters, we have quite a range. I really do think you can make a somewhat decent character with any fighter, because you do get a lot of attacks, action surge is really good, and you can pack on that extra feat at 6th level. And so, pick up a heavy weapon or a ranged weapon, pick some smart feats, and it's going to be passable. Still, 
There are some fighter subclasses that are really strong. Echo is amazing. It's technically not a caster, but in play it feels like a caster. It's as good as a caster with low level spells that it can cast an infinite number of times, but also with weapons and action surge and extra attack and all that. Rune Knight is also in a class by itself. The features here are really strong, but they are not unlimited in use. So we're in the strong subclass of B territory. C is spread right from Battlemaster at the top to Arcane Archer at the bottom, even with our other classes included. Then Cavalier, Samurai, Purple Dragon Knight, and Champion bring up the rear in D ranks. We can make passable characters with any of them, but passable. And that's the fighter. Next time I'll be looking at... Let me check my notes here. Mm, really? Already? Huh. That had to happen eventually. Monks. We'll be talking about the subclasses of the class that have been quite open about considering the worst class in the game. So bring your nose plug, and I hope you'll join me for that. Otherwise, until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.